Hello, brothers and sisters. As you know, I periodically feel like I need to give some reflections on what's happening in the wider church and some of the confusing, disturbing things that are going on. And it's not my favorite thing to do. I, I, I like to talk about what I talked about in the last video about uh, the beautiful prophecy of Simeon or my favorite video of all time is when I had my little granddaughter in my arms that just was experiencing how much God loves all of us. But I do feel like I have a responsibility to offer some reflections on uh, the recent controversy about same-sex blessings. Now, when I did the video several weeks ago about trans people being approved to be godparents, I, I made the point that even the, what the document says is that if there's any chance of scandal, uh, you know, it shouldn't be done. I would say it's virtually impossible to do some of these things that that Pope Francis and Archbishop Fernandez are saying we can do without causing scandal, without giving the wrong impression. So this latest document, just before Christmas, uh, with his clarifications afterwards, has really shaken things up quite a bit. I've never seen anything like the pushback that's going on. So what does the document say? It says, basically, in certain circumstances and as many complex conditions that have to be present, it's possible to give a blessing to couples in irregular situations, including same-sex relationships. Now, it says that people have to be not asking a blessing on their union, just on their relationship, and, and all kinds of other things as well. It has to, can't be done as a formal liturgical act. It has to be done informally. And so it doesn't teach heresy, although quite honestly, in the climate of the world in which we're living right now, and in the climate of the great power of the gay lobby within the Catholic Church, this document is being experienced as another step forward to approving or normalizing irregular, uh, whether it's people who have gotten uh, remarried in a civil marriage without re receiving an annulment or people in a same-sex relationship. It's being hailed widely by people in the church and outside the church as another step in the Catholic Church approving same-sex relationships and diminishing the seriousness of sexual wrongdoing. Uh, you know, right after uh, the document came out, Father James Martin, who's been a very favored priest under this pontificate, uh, called up the New York Times and said, show up tomorrow morning, this is going to be a really great photo op. And he invited a homosexual couple that had been civilly married uh, to come to his, his rectory, I suppose, and they're holding hands there while he gives them a blessing. Now, this actually violates what the document says. It says, you know, it uh, should be private. It be spontaneous. It shouldn't be pre-planned. And, and here we have probably the most favored priest on this area uh, in the Catholic Church, appointed by Pope Francis to a Vatican responsibility, uh, I'm sure he's the one that got Pope Francis to write to all these pro-LGBTQ organizations, Catholic organizations in the United States, commending them for their compassion and things like that. And here we have this photo op in the New York Times, which looks like the church is blessing a same-sex relationship of a homosexual couple holding hands. No correction yet. And then we also have the uh, national hierarchies of Germany and Belgium and you know other places say, oh good, this is confirming us in the direction we're going in, even though the document says you can't do formal liturgical blessings, which these countries are doing in some cases. Uh, they're saying, yes, this is this is favoring us. This is endorsing the direction we're going in. And then you have political figures like Chris Christie, who's running for the Republican nomination for president. 
uh, saying that he's going to change his views on opposing same-sex marriage because the Catholic Church is changing its views. Now, you might say maybe he's using this as an excuse, it's politically expedient, it gives up some cover as a Catholic, but nevertheless, this is how the world and how many people in the church are interpreting this document. Uh, yeah, and, and it, it's, just, it's just really, really a difficulty. But you also have amazing pushback going on, like I've never seen before. This is pretty amazing. You have whole bishops' conferences saying, no, we're not going to do this in our countries. We're not going to do this in our dioceses. Uh, there's no way that this won't be scandalous to people. There's no way in which blessing people in our regular relationships or uh, same-sex relationships won't be scandalous to people. You know, just uh, a list of some of the countries and some of the dioceses, sometimes a whole bishops' conference in some of these countries is saying, no, we're not going to do this. Um, U Ukraine, the Greek Catholic Church, which is the biggest Eastern Orthodox Church united to Rome, says, this can't apply to us. This is contrary to our understanding of blessings. So this will not be accepted or implemented in the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. This is very significant. And then you have countries like dioceses in Brazil, countries like Kenya, Rwanda, Zambia, Cameroon. I'm going to read the Cameroon Bishops Conference statement in just a few minutes. Malawi, Nigeria, Angola, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Sao Tome, and Principe, Kazakhstan, openly refusing to allow the blessings of same-sex couples in their diocese. And then you have the Bishops Conference in Hungary. Uh, very well respected. Cardinal Erdu, very, very solid priests and bishops saying, no, we, we can't do this in our diocese. There's no way that this won't be scandalous to people or give the wrong impression. Same in Kazakhstan and other places as well. <laughs> so, this is significant. Uh, Archbishop Fernandez, the person who wrote these documents for Pope Francis, came out with a press release sort of trying to back off some of the things that Fiducia Supplicans said, saying basically, you know, this is a magisterial document, so you can't reject it, although we are willing to accept that people in their cultural situations uh, may not implement it in the same way as we are intending it to be implemented, but just don't call us heretics or blasphemers. So, so it's kind of a pathetic press release. And then it goes on to give a possible example about what would be an acceptable blessing. And it talks about somebody coming, wanting to live a better Christian life, perhaps wanting to change their lifestyle. And then after it, praying for the person, like an intercessory prayer rather than a blessing, uh, for God's help to help them in this journey, uh, he talks about giving the individuals in the relationship a blessing rather than blessing the couple. So these are distinctions that they're trying to make, but the average person is not going to get them. Now, I think it's significant that there's such a strong opposition in Africa. You know, when the recently concluded first session of the Synod of Bishops concluded, people are kind of surprised that there's nothing in there about uh, blessing same-sex relationships, because a lot of that did come up in the Synod. But Basically, they had a plan. They knew they couldn't get it through the Senate. They knew there'd be really strong opposition, particularly from the Africans, but from many others as well. And so they decided to unilaterally issue a declaration from the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, which they did. Now, I think this is really insulting to the Africans. I think this is really insulting to the whole idea of a synodal church. Uh, we're supposed to be kind of working on these things together, you know, moving towards understanding together. And here we have a preemptive, authoritative intervention on a very hot topic that there's a lot of opposition on. And it almost seems like it's like a violation, not only of the dignity of the African church, but also uh, of the whole idea of synodal process, you know, walking together. And I, I can't help but think about the statement that Cardinal Casper made back in the uh, sentence on the family where the Africans were raising some of their same concerns about what was going on there, about regularizing uh, 
you know, divorce and remarriage in a certain kind of way. And uh, Cardinal Casper made the public statement, much to his embarrassment, that we shouldn't really pay too much attention to these Africans. It's that European arrogance, this corrupt Western European church, where the numbers are just collapsing and there's hardly any vocations thinking they're superior because of their sophisticated theology, which isn't bringing anybody to Christ. And so they've adopted a strategy now of let's be as friendly to the world and the world's values as we possibly can. Let's tell them how concerned we are about climate. Let's tell them about how compassionate and how inclusive and how open we want to be as a church. Let's particularly reach out to the LGBTQ communities because that's such an issue for the world today. That's what they say is the new civil rights issue of our time. So let's get on board. But what the trouble is, is that Churches that have taken this approach just deteriorate. Like right now, you know, 25% of all the Methodist churches in the United States have left the Methodist denomination because they've gone soft on the LGBTQ issues. One of the things that the African bishop said they were most concerned about is that we're going to lose people to the evangelical and Pentecostal church because those churches say, look, the Catholic church is departing from the scripture in the area of sexuality, in the area of homosexuality. So this is weakening the church. This will not strengthen the church. This is weakening the church. Now, I'm not going to get into some of the fine details. There's tremendous articles being written, statements being issued by really fine theologians, cardinals, and bishops. Cardinal Mueller has published tremendously insightful articles. I, I have such a regard for Cardinal Mueller. He, he knows the tradition. He knows the scriptures. He knows the magisterium. He was the former cardinal in charge of the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. He was Archbishop Fern Cardinal Fernandez's predecessor. He really knows what he's doing. He knows the level of magisterial documents. He knows their level of authority. And he also knows how right now, he says, right now, there's discordance in the magisterium. There are apparent contradictions. There are different emphases. There's an objective reason for people to be confused. He said in 2021, uh, the same office for the doctrine of the faith when it was asked whether we could do blessings for same-sex couples, said, no, we can't bless sin. Now, when Cardinal Fernandez was asked about that statement, he said, well, that statement doesn't really have the smell of Francis. You know, the smell of the sheep, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't have the smell of Francis. Well, this document that Cardinal Fernandez has published, I would say doesn't have the smell of the gospel. You know, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Uh, Jesus said, you got to turn away from serious sin. Now, Francis is on record for saying that sexual sins are the least serious sins. That is not what the gospel or the tradition of the church say. It isn't like we rank the different sins, but there's gravely wrong things that are very offensive to the Lord and very damaging to people, and certainly sexual immorality is right in there. You know, if it's the least serious sin, it's still a sin that can send you to hell, and that's very, very clear in sacred scripture and sacred tradition. It's very, very clear in Mary's warnings at Fatima, you know. I, I won't go into all that. I've, I've, I've done videos on that. And I, I, I would like to tell you that I've been talking about this for several years. I've seen it coming. I don't want to say I predicted it, but I did. This is the agenda. People continually look at the text of a document and say, well, there's nothing explicitly heretical here. It's on the very edge, but there's nothing specifically heretic here. Uh, some people say, well, it's a beautiful document. It's so balanced. It's so nuanced. It's so sophisticated. But it isn't just a matter of the text itself. It's the matter of the context in which the text is issued. This text is issued in an ecclesial context, a church context, a world context, a cultural context, where it's going to be interpreted just as it has been, as another step forward to 
approving same-sex relationships and diminishing the importance of sexual immorality. And that's what people got the whiff of. It doesn't have the smell of the gospel. And listen to what the uh, cardinals and the uh, bishops in Cameroon have said. They publish a document on behalf of the entire bishops' conference in Cameroon. As a number of points, it says, in conformity with our 2013 Declaration on Homosexuality, we firmly reaffirm the truth of the church, mother and teacher, which teaches the sacredness of the sexual identity of man and woman created in the image of God, Genesis 1, the dignity of their sexuality and of marriage, which is the foundation of the family. The human person has created male and female, this immutable difference, which is the foundation of the relationship and complementarity, is fulfilled only in the bonds of marriage. And it goes on to say, homosexuality falsifies human anthropology and trivializes sexuality, marriage and the family, the foundation of society. In African culture, this practice is not part of family and social values. It is a flagrant violation of the heritage bequeathed to us by our ancestors. In the history of peoples, homosexual practices have never given rise to societal evolution, but are clear signs of the implosive decadence of civilizations. In fact, homosexuality sets humanity against itself and destroys it. Oh, it goes on. That, that's just two out of ten points, and they're very strong. They're saying, look at nature. The natural law says this is wrong. This is unnatural. Don't be so blind as to close your eyes to the perversity of sexuality apart from marriage and the family. And then we have very brave pastors just on their own making the judgment that this would be scandalous, that this would be uh, misleading to people, that this would be confusing to people. So here, Monsignor Pope, as you know, I just have the highest regard for Monsignor Pope. Week after week, he keeps commenting on the scripture in just a tremendously clear and faithful way. And he says, yeah, this declaration in no way authorizes same-sex marriage. In fact, it explicitly reaffirms the church's teaching that marriage is only between a man and a woman, and that sexual relations are only moral within marriage. The document does say that there may be times when people are living in objectively sinful ways, such as cohabitation or homosexual relationships, could receive a kind of informal blessing in no way resembling the right of marriage. However, the document also states that these informal blessings should only be given if there's no risk of causing confusion about the church's doctrine on sexual morality, including the nature of marriage. So, he says, as your pastor, I want to say that the declaration requires no changes at our parish and that there will not be the conferring of informal blessings here for relationships of couples in irregular unions. I say this because in the discernment I'm required to make as pastor, I think the blessings of such unions would in fact lead to confusion and scandal among the faithful regarding the church's teachings on marriage and sexuality. Having thus made the discernment and decision required of me, I ask your understanding and prayers, realize, realizing that I have as my duty the care of all souls here and the duty to protect the faithful from confusion or error. That would likely come from conferring such blessings. I must therefore decline to offer them. Finally, I'd like to just quote something that Archbishop Chapu said. He said, we've had such great popes, and we've kind of gotten used to completely trusting the papal office. But there's limits to trusting the papal office. The pope is not above the word of God. The Pope is not above the tradition of the church. The Pope can't himself invent new doctrines or, or impose a particular theology on the church that hasn't kind of arisen out of, out of Scripture and tradition. So he says he, he admires Pope Francis for his emphasis on the poor, and being merciful, and being inclusive. But he says, it's also a fact that his over-reliance on the society of Jesus is unhealthy considering the society seeming surrendered to the spirit of the age in too many instances. Somebody's finally saying it. Many of the Jesuit institutions have gone over the cliff. They're out in the open about favoring the LGBTQ agenda. 
And under it all, it's not just sexual morality, but it's the truth of the scripture. It's the truth of divine revelation. It's the authority of the word of God. And it really deeply impacts uh, the rationale for evangelization and deeply impacts whether we really feel like it matters whether people become Christians or not. But that's time for another video. Then it says, Archbishop Chaput goes on to say, Francis is intolerant of even respectful disagreement. His manner can often seem mean-spirited. His complaints about the Church of the United States are insulting and uninformed, and they embarrass the dignity of his office. They also discourage many bishops, priests, religious, and lay faithful who heroically live the gospel in an age of aggressive secularism and hostility to the Church. And most regrettably, his ambiguity on matters of doctrine creates confusion and feeds division in the church when we already have a surfeit of both. If saying these things is disloyal, then so is the truth. What we need is more brave bishops like Archbishop Chapu and more brave pastors like Monsignor Pope. And it really, it's a no-brainer. This is going to cause confusion and scandal for sure is. And I'm happy to say in my own diocese, without making a big fuss about it, Bishop Boyer has instructed our priests that we need to further reflect on this whole issue. But in the meantime, there'll be no blessings of people in our regular relationships. And I think a lot of bishops are doing that very quietly. And this is really significant, the pushback. But you know what? I'm also saddened because what this is doing is bringing into question the stability of the Catholic Church's magisterium. I mean, this is serious. There's wavering. There's apparent contradictions. There's obvious leanings in the direction of accommodating to the culture. And this was very disturbing to many people. African bishop after African bishop said, our people are disturbed. Our people are scandalized. And they should be. What we really need to do is to hear from our leadership a clearer proclamation of the gospel. We need to uh, not only be concerned about the smell of the sheep and the smell of Francis, we need to think about the aroma of Christ. And he's a sign of contradiction, like my last video talked about, the prophecy of Simeon. He's a sign of contradiction. We want to welcome everybody. We want to include everybody. We want to love everybody, no matter what their difficulties are. But we want to love them by gently leading them to repentance, to faith, to conversion. We want to be a welcoming church. We want to be an inclusive church. But what we're welcoming people is to meet Jesus Christ, who's so compassionate. He'll forgive our sins. He'll give us the grace of repentance. And the, the church, through its sacraments and through its teaching and through its accompaniment, can lead us to the healing of our souls so that we can no longer be slaves to sin, no longer slaves to sexual sin or any kind of serious sin, because Jesus Christ has set us free. And he says that the scripture says, when the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. But let's help people meet the Son. Let's help people meet Jesus and get delivered from delusion and deception and false teaching and come into the glorious freedom of the sons and daughters of God. I'm probably going to have to talk about some of these things again. So if you haven't already, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to our channel and click the little bell so you get a notification when a new video comes out. But uh, anyway, I hope I can get back next week to some other things, but there are some serious issues I'm going to have to talk about in the coming months. God bless you.